Hello, this is Dr. Corey Hall from the Bonk Scholar YouTube channel and WellRoundedPianist.com. Uh, if you're interested in playing piano and want to learn more or want to become a better pianist, go check out the Well-Rounded Pianist. Uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised at what you find there. Uh, you can subscribe for 30 days for free if you'd like and uh, sign up after that. It's an excellent site. There's, there's a lot going on there. This presentation that I'm offering to you today has nothing to do with musical performance. Okay, and many of you know me as being a pianist and uh, that's what I do. I make piano videos. This video is something totally different. It has nothing to do with performance. Nothing. But it has a lot to do with Bach's musical mind and the way he worked as a composer. Uh, before we continue, I just want to point out, you might want to put your video on full screen so you'll be able to see the whiteboard better as, as I uh, go through the presentation. <clears throat> this video consists of two halves. The presentation in the first half is all about Bach's use, or at least an introduction into Bach's use of the B-A-C-H motif which is very well known to musical scholars. And the second half, um, which is on this side of the whiteboard here, is, is on something that's not known. Actually, I believe it's new information that's never been published before, and it's Bach's use of the SDG motif in his music. And uh, the title of my presentation is Bach's use of cryptograms and number symbolism in his music. Fascinating topic. Um, Christoph Wolf, in his very well-known book here, Johann Sebastian Bach, The Learned Musician, makes it very clear several times in this book that Bach considered himself to be not just a composer, but he considered himself to be a creator of works of musical science. There's a big difference between just a mere composer and a creator of works of musical science. I believe that Bach's musical science, or at least part of Bach's musical science, one that uh, needs to be researched more, has to do with his use of cryptograms and number symbolism, which uh, I'll talk about for, for over an hour um, after this little introduction. Um, I became heavily involved with Bach's use of symbolism in his music in the 1990s as a graduate student. I was working on a master's degree in musicology and also a, a doctoral degree in performance. And um, I became very uh, intrigued and I, I did a lot of research, uh, a lot of, which is unpublished, which I'm making available to you today. And um, I also uh, did a lot of research into Bach's use of tempo, which also has, has not been published. Uh, so the, this presentation has nothing to do with tempo, it has nothing to do with performance, but it has everything to do with the way Bach thought and the way that his, his, the way that his mind operated. So at the very least, if this presentation simply opens the doors for future Bach scholarship, for Bach scholars that are, or scholars that are, that are now that are interested in this, or later scholars, um, that's, I'll be happy if this just simply opens the doors to that. But uh, let me make it, make it known that what you're about to learn in at least most of the second half of this presentation has never before been published and never before known to the world. These are, these are facts and discoveries I've made uh, way back in 1992 and now it's 2018 and I thought well it's, it's high time that I put this out here now with the internet and everybody knows. The reason I'm doing it now is symbolic. Just five days ago, it was Bach's birthday, March 21st. But it wasn't just any birthday. 
It was his 333rd birthday. 333. And I thought, oh, I've got to do a video because it's his 333rd video in order to symbolize the Trinity three times. We, we all know Bach was a very devout uh, Lutheran, a very religious man. And so 333, it's very it's religious symbolism right there in your face. So I thought, I've got to do it. And I almost made this video on Bach's birthday, but I had other things to do. So now it's the 26th of March, 2018, uh, just after the 333rd birthday of Johann Sebastian Bach, I believe the greatest composer who ever lived. So without any further ado, here is Bach's use of cryptograms and number symbolism in his music, which consists of two parts. Hello, thank you for joining me today. This is Corey, and my presentation today is on Bach's use of cryptograms and number symbolism. Cryptograms and number symbolism. If you're wondering what this all means, uh, you can just go to Wikipedia and you can look up musical cryptogram. And there's a very nice, nice, uh, short but nice article there on what a cryptogram is and uh, number symbolism. You can, can probably uh, uh, figure out what that means if you don't know so already. Numbers that symbolize various things, maybe perhaps words. I've been interested in this type of thing for a very long time. I was in graduate school obtaining my master's and doctoral degrees in the 1990s and I was involved with um, a very, very intense research on Bach's use of tempo which uh, really has nothing to do with my presentation today, but a box use of tempo, and also as a side, uh, as a side issue that I dealt with a lot during those days, was box use of cryptograms and number symbolism. Uh, a lot of what you will learn in this presentation today has never been made public. It has never been published. It is information that I discovered, I believe I discovered, I've never seen it, anything published before on it. At the same time, much of this information that I'll give you is common knowledge among scholars. So uh, generally speaking, this, the first half of this presentation today is on this side of the whiteboard, which is mostly, mostly common knowledge to Bach scholars and other musical scholars. On the other side of the whiteboard, which is the second half of this presentation, is mostly um, never before discovered information that I have I discovered way back in the 1990s, actually around 1992. It's never been published before and now in 2018 I'm finally making it public uh, to, for the world to learn more about Bach and his creative process. Now, uh, the first thing I want to do is just explain a little about why, why Bach. Well, you know, Christoph Wolff, in his very famous uh, biography of Bach, uh, states, or he, he makes the point very many times, that Bach was not, didn't consider himself just a composer. Bach considered himself uh, a creator of works of musical science. So Bach himself, he, he, back in, in Bach's day, a composer was usually just someone who composed sort of simple things like a town piper would do. And Bach was better than that. Bach created works of musical science. But one thing I've discovered about Bach, and I, I don't think, I've never read this anywhere, this may be new information for a lot of you, that, um, you know, and it's fascinating stuff here. Bach was born on the 21st of March, 1685. Oh, by the way, let me just back up a little bit. I want to back up. Uh, five days ago, it was Bach's birthday, and actually I was planning on doing this presentation 
and uploading that on Bob's birthday, but things got in the way and I couldn't do that. But I discovered that, and the reason why I wanted to do this, this presentation on Bob's birthday this year was this year in 2018 was uh, to the 21st of March, which was five days ago from today. It was Bob's 333rd birthday. How's that for symbolism? Three times the Trinity. So that's very symbolic in itself. So I thought, oh, I have to do a presentation on Bob's 333rd birthday. Okay, so now let's get back to this. Now, Bach was born on the 21st of March, 1685. Okay, if we put, if we put that in numbers here, 21, and you know, and for the Europeans, they put the date first, then the month. Unlike Americans who do it the other way around. <clears throat> so we have the 21st, 21, 3, 85. And I left out the 16, because traditionally the, the uh, two first digits of, of the uh, millennium and century or, are omitted. Okay? So we have 21st, 21, 3, 85. Now, what do you get when you assign letters of the alphabet to each one of these to its birth date? You have a B for 2, you have an A for 1, you have a C for 3, and you have an A for H. B, A, C, H. Now, if Bach had one more letter in his last name, an E, Bach, which does exist, it, it is a name in the German language, that it, it would have been perfect. But, but we're leaving out the five. So you simply leave out the five, and you have B, A, C, H. So, in other words, Bach, Bach's birthday was his name. How many people can you think of whose birthday symbolizes their name? Bach had no control over that. He was just born that way. Now, I happen to believe in God. I believe, I know you might think this is crazy and everything, but I believe that this was God's master plan. That what you're going to learn about the the way that Bach used his name for musical pitches and musical motifs was it sort of he was born to do that. So he was born to do that. I believe that God had this plan for him and he knew it. I know, you know, I can't prove it of course, but I I know. <laughs> I mean, with, with Bach being interested in numbers and symbolism and all that, he pro very, very likely discovered this at a very young age. He, he may have been, you know, age six or seven, and he probably discovered, uh, wow, look at that, my name is also my birth date. And he also probably discovered that his name is also a very effective musical motif that not only Bach used, but other composers used as well. We'll get into this in a few minutes here. Um, first, I want to just talk a little about Robert Schumann. Um, and the reason why I mentioned Schumann is that it's very well known, probably even more well known than, than the Bach motive, or mo motif, I should say. Some people say motive. That Schumann used these motifs in his music, very well known. Uh, Schumann's Opus 1, the Abegg Variations, was composed for a woman with the last name of Abegg. It's not known for certain who that was. It may have been a fictitious person, but regardless of who it is, you have A, B flat, E, G, G. And so Schumann made a nice waltz and a variation on that waltz using the letters Abeg, which he in, in which he dedicated it to this, it says on the music here, uh, Paulina von Abeg, dedicated to her. Now, let's just go over the pitches in German for those of you that don't know. Uh, B, 
Okay, yeah, this may be a little confusing because I remember it was for me many years ago when before I knew German. Okay, uh, the German musical alphabet is a, is a little strange for for us English speakers. B flat is called B. Actually, that it's spelled B E B. They say B, and it's the same pronunciation as the second letter of the alphabet. So they say B, and that means B flat. So, so they don't say B flat, they say B. And also E flat, <clears throat> which is, uh, E flat in German is called S. It's called E, and E flat has an S on it. So it's an E with a flat, which is E with an S. So S. So S, which you can symbolize by simply the letter S, is E flat in German. And also os, uh, the letter A, or the musical pitch A flat in German is A with an S, os. So, so A, S, so that Schumann used A, S, and then C, and then an H. Now let me get to the H. In the German musical alphabet, what we in the West, uh, us English speakers call, call B, we call that B. The Germans call it H. Don't ask me why. I, I don't even know why. That would be a good topic to research. But it, it's called H. So we have, so simply, if you take B flat, A, C, and then B natural, okay? You have B, A, C, H. Sounds like this. In other words, you go down a half step, up a minor third, and down another half step, and you have B, A, C, H. Well, let me get back to Schumann here. I went on a little tangent. So, anyway, it's very well known that Schumann, uh, Robert Schumann, used, it's a very well known among scholars and performers that Schumann did this sort of thing. So for a little uh, research project for you, you might want to look at the Schumann's Abegg Variations, Opus 1, and <clears throat> probably the next most famous work, and probably the one where he uses cryptography the most, is his Carnival, Opus 9. The Carnival, Opus 9, he uses a E flat, which is S, he uses C and H, Osh, that symbolizes a city in Germany, and also you can, he symbolizes it as well with a flat CH, which also, also spells Osh, and he even says this in a, in a, in a movement there, he says A, S, C, H, and, and so forth, and I listed here some movements that have that in it, and then you have an inversion, which means instead of going up to C, A flat up to C, it goes A flat down to C, and then down to H. So there are several different ways of using these musical motifs. A musical motif is simply three, usually three or four, sometimes two, pitches that make something. Probably the most famous musical motif in music is so you have Beethoven's fifth. He uses that very famous motif of a third going down a third and then going down another third. So that's probably the most famous motif in, in all of music, all of classical music. And uh, Schumann used it throughout the Carnival Opus 9. So another uh, research project for you would be to go to the Carnival, Opus 9, of Schumann, go through the movements and see how many of these, see how many ways you can find that Schumann used either A, S, C, H, like A, E flat, C, B in English, or A flat, C, B, or A flat, C, B. He used it very many different ways, and it's usually at the beginning of the piece, which sort of forms the crux of the um, of the character of the piece. So, 
that's just a little introduction here because Schumann is probably a little more well known uh, to have used these symbolic elements in his music than Bach. But scholars, musicologists are very familiar with what Bach did and, and all of this here is, is really common knowledge. This is nothing new, nothing that I discovered myself. But let me just go over this briefly here. Well, I went over this already here, B-A-C-H. We have Bach's name in musical pitches. And the work in which he used this the most, and it's the most famous, is the art of the fugue. The art of fugue, which is uh, the, the most famous theme that he used was the one that was uncompleted, which was uh, Contrapuntus 14. Contrapuntus 14 is the final fugue in the Art of Fugue, which was unfinished. And the last theme that Bach used before it was unfinished was B-A-C-H, and it sort of uh, dies away after that. Some people believe that he just all of a sudden died and wasn't able to complete it. Others believe that it was completed, but it's been lost. I happen to believe it was completed, but lost, but that's another story. Anyway... <coughs> Excuse me. So you have B A C H, B flat A C B natural. Now, these are called permutations. One, this is this is the the uh, original. You call it the original. You can also transpose it. I, I didn't have transpose here, but you can transpose it if you don't start on B flat, but you can start on any pitch you want. Let's start on F. F, E, G sharp. I'm sorry, it would be G. F, E, G natural, F sharp. That would be a transposed version of it beginning on F. So as long as you keep these intervals the same, it'll be a transposed permutation. Inversion. The in, an inversion is when you go the opposite directions. So instead of going down a half step, up minor third, down a half step, you actually go up a half step, down a minor third, up a half step. So the inversion of B A C H starting on B flat would sound like this. to the opposite directions of the original here. Now, <clears throat> another way that Bach and other composers as well who, who worked with uh, uh, cryptograms or also the, the well-known 12-tone composers did this as well, like Arnold Schoenberg, is here's, here is a permutation in retrograde. So retrograde simply means backwards. So when, when a motif goes backwards, he's just starting, instead of B-A-C-H, it would be like H-C-A-B. <laughs> so if you go H-C-A-B, it would be B natural, C, A, B flat. Now notice that when you, when you take B-A-C-H in retrograde, it's basically exactly the same as the inversion. It's just a, a it's just a transposed version of the inversion. So this one and this one aren't even different. They do the exact same thing. They just start on different pitches. They're just transposed. Probably the most complicated one of all of the permutations is retrograde inversion. This means that a motif is used backwards and upside down. So if you take an inversion, the original is this. Now if you go if if you go the opposite directions, if you go up, down, up, instead of down, up, down, and you maintain the same intervals, then you have then all you have to do is take that and then go backwards. 
So you turn, turn this upside down, and then you also go backwards. And that's what leads to this. So you have a B, right? I'm sorry, you have a what we English speakers call a B, then a B flat, then a D flat, and C. So this one goes... <coughs> now, <laughs> once again, if you go retrograde inversion, it's it's basically it's the same as this one. It hasn't really changed. It's just a transposition. So to make a long story short, the BACH motive only can be stated. Uh, it, it could only be stated like two different ways, and it's original in a transposition, which is like the retrograde inversion, or an inversion. Because, because the retrograde is the same as the inversion, it's just a transposition. So, in, in other words, it's a very compact musical motive in, in, in which, which these four permutations, or the original and the three main permutations, are not different. There's only two, two ways to do it. Now, when we learn about the, the SDG motive, or motif, Bach's use of the Bach and SDG motifs. When we learn about that in the second half of this presentation, on the other side of this whiteboard, we'll discover that the SDG motif is different for each one of the permutations. So it, it's actually more useful. And so that's why I believe the SDG motif was the, the most used motif in all of Bach's music. So. The BACH motive, it, uh, as, as novel as it is, and as, as interesting as it is, that he, you can spell Bach's name with it, it's not um, a motive that, or motif that you can use a lot. It's, it's um, sort of a novelty item. But the SDG motive, which we'll learn about in the second half, is, is really, you can use it all the time, and Bach did. <coughs> Excuse me. So now, the art of fugue is, as, as I mentioned here, is, is the most famous work that uses the BACH motive. I've uh, made a list, actually many years ago I made a whole big list and I went through Bach's complete works or something that took me a couple years to do. I listed all the BACH motifs I could find and I don't have that right now, it's in my computer, but it's a fascinating topic. If you have the time on your hands and, and you have the interest, you might want to look into that. But now, let's go down here to Contrapuntus 8. That's the 8th fugue in the Art of Fugue. Contrapuntus 8, bar 40. So, contra, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is Contrapuntus 8, bar 40, is the very first time in the whole art of few, that the B A C H motif motif is stated. Actually, it, and and it's not in its original form. He uses actually it's in the second subject here. You can see here. That's, that's actually like the second subject, I believe. If you take, if you start here, G, F sharp, A, three times, and then G sharp, you have, you have a retrograde version of B-A-C-H. So Bach spelled his name backwards, but he didn't do it with the actual pitches. But then, a few bars later, in bars 44 to 45, is the very first time in the complete Art of Feud that Bach used B-A-C-H and did not transpose it, but he had the original pitches. It's still in retrograde. But we have B-flat here, A, C, three of them, and then an, an H. 
Ja, B, A, C, H. So this sounds like this, and I'm going to play it from here to there. It sounds like this. It sounds a little austere for our ears, but when you put it into context and you listen to the complete contrapuntus, you'll you'll um, hear how it fits in. So we have a B B A C H. Now re the reason I I point this out, remember this for the second half of this presentation when we go to the S D G motive. Remember this bars forty four to forty five is the first instance in the complete art of fugue where the B-A-C-H motif is used with the original letters. Okay, so it's the first place that Bach spelled his name 2138 B-A-C-H in the complete art of fugue. And then in Contrapunctus 11, Contrapunctus 11 is another triple fugue. Okay, so Contrapuntus 8 is a triple fugue. It has three subjects. Contrapuntus 11 is sort of the counterpart to Contrapuntus 8. That has also has three subjects, but they're all inverted. Okay, so they're sort of turned upside down. So what happens is in bars 90 to 91 in Contrapuntus 11 is the first place in the art of fugue, that B-A-C-H appears uh, um, in, in its normal form here. Here in Contrapuntus 11, it's uh, here in bars 44 to 45, it's backwards. Here it's forwards. We have a B flat, A, C, H right there in bars 90 to 91 of Contrapuntus 11. And then the famous place here, this is the most famous B-A-C-H, this is the one that you'll see in all the books, Contrapuntus 14. Okay? Remember this number, 14. You have B-A-C-H. You have B-flat, A-C, B-natural in half notes. So they're long notes and they stick out. It's very obvious. Very obvious. Bach didn't make it that obvious uh, in any other place. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, we have um, Contrapuntus 14, bars 193 to 195. This is the entry of the last subject. This is the section that was incomplete. Um, okay, so, let's go... Okay, this, this pretty much is common knowledge. Okay, there, here, there's nothing new that I've discovered here, so this is all common knowledge for scholars. This is common knowledge, this is common knowledge. Okay, the, what I'm, what I'm going to go over here on the bottom is not so common knowledge. I think that I I've, haven't I've, read anywhere about these things. Actually, one of them is, this is, but these aren't. As well as the other side of this whiteboard. So let me go over these this bottom part of the whiteboard here. <clears throat> now, Bach was fascinated with numbers. And as I told you here, as I pointed out at the beginning of this presentation, he was born the 21st of March, 1685. 2138 B-A-C-H. Well, you'd, you'd think he knew that. I am positive he knew that from a very young age. So he knew he was born to do this. This was what he was born to do. God just sort of implanted this in him. You know, God made him be born on this day. He gave him the name Bach, everything in order for Bach to fulfill his purpose on earth, which was to compose all this great music. And Bach composed the music for the glory of God, and we'll get to that on the other side of this whiteboard here. But, leaving the um, theology aside, and, and just looking at it from a secular point of view, we have 2138. 2138. 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 8 equals 14. 14. Bach loved the number 14. 
Look at this. Contrapunctus 14 was, was the, the last fugue in the Kant Art of Fugue in which Bach states his name. Contrapunctus 14. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't think so at all. No. He planned this from the very beginning. He loved numbers. 2, 1, 3, 8. The, the addition of those equal 14. Now, <clears throat> Bach's partitas. Okay, Bach composed six partitas for keyboard. And um, it's not, not really well known to a lot of people, but it, it's up right on his title page. You can look at his title page of the partitas. And Bach himself published and had, had everything controlled over the publication of the six partitas when he finally published them all together in one group. He called the six partitas Opus One. Opus One. This was his big this was his big entry into publishing in Europe. This was actually his first publication was the six partitas. He called it Opus One. Six partitas for, for uh, clavier. Now, this is fascinating. Fascinating stuff here. I, I haven't seen this anywhere. I think it's my discovery. If you take the Preludium, which is the opening, and you take the Allemande, which is the second movement, the Preludium has 21 bars. Okay? The Allemande has 38 bars. Get your music and count it. I've counted it a thousand times. I know it's right. 21 bars plus 38 bars equal B-A-C-H. B-A-C-H. So what Bach did in his Opus 1, his first large publication, was he imprinted his name into the music cryptographically. He used a cryptogram here. 21 bars, 38 bars. Now, that doesn't tell us anything about the way to play it or the performance or anything, but it's a fascinating glimpse into Bach's mind, into the way his mind worked. Now, I found another one of these things, and, you know, I'm sure there are probably a lot of these instances like this that I haven't discovered. So this might open new ground for new research and, and uh, Bach research studies. But um, here's another one I discovered, which is fascinating to me. Sinfonias, okay, the 15 Sinfonias, also known as the three-part inventions. Bach, um, you know, eventually he, he published the in two-part and three-part inventions all together, the inventions and Sinfonias, okay? But um, he, when he composed all the Sinfonias together, he had them all as a group. Now, if you take Sinfonia number one, as 21 bars. Sinfonia 15 has 38 bars. The first and the last. The first Sinfonia and the last Sinfonia spell or symbolize cryptographically Bach's name. Bach sort of just wrote, in, wrote his name into the first and last Sinfonias. Fascinating. But still, this doesn't tell us how to perform it. This doesn't tell us anything, but, but that he did this, which, is, which should tell us a lot about the way that Bach thought. You know, in my, my research has shown that Bach loved symmetry. He loved firsts and lasts. It probably came from the Alpha and Omega, the Alpha and Omega of Jesus Christ, who he worshipped, the first and the last, the first Sinfonia and the last Sinfonia. He spelled his name, B-A-C-H. The same way an artist, a visual artist, would sort of hide his signature into a painting. Bach is hiding his name into the Sinfonias. <clears throat> one last one here. And, you know, I, I wish I had a whiteboard uh, three times the size because I could fill it up. Believe me, I've <laughs> done a lot of research on this. I had a hard time selecting what I would put on here and what I would leave out. So at least that this will open up, um, open up the grounds for more research in this area. This last one here, actually this is, actually this is known. 
I've seen this mentioned in books before, so I'm not, I don't think this is my discovery. Or it, 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 it's not my discovery, but it's fascinating anyway. If you take um, um, 14, okay, if you take the well-tempered clavier, and you take the first fugue, the fugue in C major from the well-tempered clavier, subject ends right there. Fugue number one from the well-tempered clavier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen notes in the first subject. So I believe that Bach did that. Just he, he, you know, he probably just thought he was probably really happy he could do that. He was probably jumping for joy when he wrote, "Oh." You know, I have to put 14 notes in there to symbolize my name, B-A-C-H. 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 8 equals 14. He loved the number 14. As you can see many times, and he did it also in the first subject of the, the, uh, the notes of the first fugue of his great well-tempered clavier, which is 48 preludes and fugues. So, very fascinating, fascinating stuff. I've seen this mentioned before in books by uh, scholars who were involved with, with Bach's symbolism research. So I think I've gone over everything I want to on this board right now, but um, before I go on to the second half of this presentation, I just want to just let it sink in a little bit. I, I want you to really think about this, really, really give it a lot of thought, that Bach was, okay, Bach was born with a name with four letters in it. Those four letters happen to work very well as a musical motif. Because not all names, hardly any names, work well as a musical motif. So, Bach was born with four letters in his last name that happened to work very well as a musical motif. They all add to 14. Switch it around, it's 41. A lot of scholars find 41 everywhere too, but I, I haven't gone into that here, but that's another uh, area of research. So, Bach was born with a name that works as a musical motif, but not only that, this is when it gets really <laughs> mind-blowing. He was born on the day that symbolizes his name and the musical motif he would use throughout his life and in his last great work, The Art of Few. He was born the 21st of March, 1685. B-A-C-H. So, <laughs> he had a name, he had a birth date, and he had a musical motif. This is just mind-blowing, okay? Now, if you think that this is mind-blowing, stay tuned for the second half of this presentation. You will be absolutely dumbfounded with what I have discovered in Bach's music. When I flip over this whiteboard and show you what I have discovered, which nobody in history has discovered before, this is the first time it's ever been published, you will absolutely just, you will fall off your chair. I guarantee it. So stay tuned for the second half of this presentation, which is uh, focuses primarily on Bach's use of the SDG motif. Hello and welcome back to part two, the second half of my presentation of uh, Bach's use of cryptograms and number symbolism in his music. I hope you watched the whole first half. If you haven't, please do so now and um, you will, you'll discover some very interesting things. So, this half of my presentation is really designed to 
to be a, a sequel to the first half. So please view uh, part one if you haven't done so already. <clears throat> so we learned in part one that Bach was born with four letters of his last name that symbolize a very useful musical motif of four notes. And also he happened to have born been born on that day numerically, the 21st of March, 1685, 2138 B-A-C-H. Okay, so that's the gist of what we learned in part one with many examples. Now, this, this part, part two, is all new information. As, as far as I know, as, as far as, as my knowledge can, can take me, this has never been discovered. This is undiscovered information, never been published before. I discovered this way back in around 1992. It's now 2018. Okay, that, that's a long time. I, this was just sort of just sitting back in my computer and it's never been published before because I was busy doing other things. This is the first time this has been known or made known to the world. Okay, these are my discoveries. Very fascinating, fascinating discoveries about the way that Bach worked. Bach worked as a composer. Now, Let's talk about the letters S, D, G. <clears throat> Excuse me. For those uh, scholars, many, many Bach scholars know this. That, that this, isn't, this is actually common knowledge among Bach scholars that Bach would very often write the, the letters S, D, G after his compositions. S, D, G means Soli Deo Gloria. In the Reformation of Martin Luther in, in the 1500s, uh, and you know Bach was the <laughs> Lutheran of all Lutheran composers, Soli Deo Gloria was like the battle cry then. Glory to one God. Glory to one God. Soli Deo Gloria. Bach was a very devout man, a very devout composer. He was the Lutheran of all Lutheran composers. He believed in God wholeheartedly. His, he often would say that he composed music for the glory of God. A lot of people don't, that doesn't sink in. I happen to be a believer in God and, and, and also a practicing Lutheran, and I can tell you that Bach's music, it really means so much to me because it's written for the glory of God. Now, whether you believe in God or whether you're of a different religion, that's that's okay, that's irrelevant to this presentation. But we have to understand where Bach was coming from. Bach was born with a name in which he used, in, in which made a, a effective musical motif, and his birth date symbolizes his name numerically. Now, that's all great, but what else did he do? Well, he used SDG. Now, if I'm, I'm willing to bet that had Schumann been a, a devout Lutheran, as Bach was, as far as I know, Schumann wasn't a very religious man, but if Schumann were a religious man, he would have used this. He would have. He would have discovered it and used it, but he didn't. Okay, as far as I know. So, let's just go over what SDG is. As I mentioned in the first half of this presentation, S in German, in the German musical language, means E flat. So we have E flat, D, G. It's a highly effective musical motif. Basically, you take a note, take a pitch, you go down a half step, and you go up a perfect fourth. S, D, G. Down a half step, up a perfect fourth. That spells out S, D, G. Now, an another very interesting thing is that, <clears throat> actually I didn't discover this until much later, 
but it's fascinating when you take the intervals here e flat to d is a one step okay so you take one step and then if you take four steps you have a one and a four you have a one a one step and then you have four steps a one and a four fourteen fourteen two plus one plus three plus eight equals fourteen so this was just another way that Bach probably discovered that not only is this a fascinating and effective musical motif but it's it's a it's just a great motif as it is. Even if we didn't associate it with SDG, it would still be a great motif. Franz Liszt used it. Uh, everyone used it. Uh, probably, I, I think every composer in history used it in some time or some form or other, and didn't necessarily know it spells out SDG. But Bach did, being the devout Lutheran that he was. So we have SDG now. We have the permutations. We have the inversion up here. So instead of going down a half step up a perfect fourth, you start on, I'm starting on the N harmonic here, D sharp, and I'm going up to E, go up a half step, down the perfect fourth. So you have, that's the inversion of Here's the original, here's the inversion. You're just flipping all of the intervals around. Now, I'm going to go to retrograde here. Instead of going S, D, G, it goes G, D, S. So now, retrograde is you start on a pitch, you go down a perfect fourth, and you go up a half step. Okay. Now we we're, now we're going to combine the inversion with, with the retrograde, and we'll have the retrograde inversion. So it would be like taking this one and going backwards. So in other words, we're going to go up a perfect fourth, up a perfect fourth, and down a half step. So we have the original, SDG, and this can be on any pitch. It's just that it literally spells SDG when you start on E flat. But Bach, you know, used this a lot, so you can't write everything in the key of E flat. So, you know, you have to transpose it. So any time you have a pitch and it goes down a half step and up to perfect fourth, you have an SDG motif. Bach used this a lot. Let me tell you. You know, when I finish this, I think you'll be convinced that this is this was the one musical motif that Bach used the most in all of his music. The BACH motive is sort of a novelty; it can't be used very much, and because it gets old, you know, it, you, and and the permutations aren't different. Here, all the permutations are different, so there, there, you can get so much out of this musical motif. I believe. It's the most effective musical motif in all of music, hands down, even not even talking about pop. It's, it's just a great musical motif. It just is. But Bach knew it symbolized SDG, and Bach knew he was on this earth to compose music for the glory of God. This is why I believe that he used it almost ad nauseum in his music. Now, <coughs> excuse me, okay, there have been books and books and books, probably dozens, maybe a hundred books written on the art of fugue, scholarly books on the art of fugue. Not one of them ever mentioned anything about Contrapunctus 10 being the SDG fugue. They always talk about the BACH fugue, Contrapunctus 14. Contrapunti 8 and 11. Yes, we all know, all scholars know those have BACH in it. But one little known thing is that I discovered way back in around 1992 was if you take Contrapunctus 10 
you have that's the theme, that's the subject to contrapuntus 10. You have an inversion, inversion of SDG. Then you have, then you have a transposition. So you have an inversion transposition. The whole entire fugue is based upon the SDG motive or motif. I call this the SDG fugue. Not one book ever mentions this. I have never seen any scholar talk about this. But it is so patently obvious that Bach wrote music for the glory of God and, he, and the SDG motive, motif, which anyone can figure out, I mean, come on, this, uh, I mean, if you're a German speaker, you should figure this out, that SDG forms a great musical motif. This has never been mentioned anywhere. So it's been hidden, it's been hidden away, and uh, which I discovered, I believe, in 1992. Now, let's take, um, well, let me, let me just mention here, Contrapunctai 8 and 11, contain many dozen combinations of Bach and SDG in all permutations. Wherever BACH occurs, SDG also occurs. And that's, I have one example here, but you know, I could, I could fill up three or five more whiteboards with examples, but I only chose this one example here. Now, Remember back in the first half of this presentation, I said to please remember bars 44 and 45 of Contrapuntus 8, being the first instance of Bach using B-A-C-H in the Art of Fugue. Okay, well, anyway, here's where that comes back again. <clears throat> now, I've written out both parts here, the treble and the bass, all four parts. This is bar 43 in Contrapuntus 8. Bar 44 is here, bar 45 is here. Now, if you take if you, the, the first place where BACH occurs without being transposed is right in the middle of bar 44. Right? It sort of ends, it's sort of midway between 44 and 45. We have a BACH here. So we have, we have a B flat, A, three C's, and an H, B-A-C-H, here. That's the first time in the, in the complete art of fugue that Bach uses his name untransposed. Okay, now, well, what do you know? Look at what's under it. Look at what's under it. You know, and, and this is not new information. This is... A, Scholars point this out all the time in books. You'll see this all the time. But what they don't point out is this. Look at what happens underneath. E flat, D, G. S, D, G. Right there. S, D, G. What Bach's doing is he's combining his name with glory to one God. That's what he came to earth to do. And that's what he did in the Art of Feud here. Now let me just try play this example slowly. It sounds like this. Slow. Sorry. Now, now I'll just play the SDG and the BACH together. Let me see. Here's the S. And here. I'm sure, you know, Bach probably, well, not probably, definitely combined these and made sure that they combined and formed good music first. He wouldn't do this if it sounded bad. If it sounded awful, he wouldn't have done it. But he discovered that the BACH motif and the SDG motif go together. Now, as I mentioned 
in the first half of this presentation, contrapunctite 8 and 11 are counterparts. They're both triple fugues, and one is the inversion of the other. So contrapunctite 8 and 11 are what I call the BACH plus SDG fugues. They combine um, both motifs. And pretty much virtually any time BACH occurs, there's an SDG underneath. All different ways and permutations. Dozens and dozens and dozens. In fact, I, I, I think I got contrapunctite 8 and 11 once and tried to count all the times that BACH and SDG occur and all the permutations. I, I just couldn't do it. It just made me dizzy. I, there's, there's probably over a hundred of them all over the place. Okay, so this is, this is really radical information. This is new information that will lead to new research in box studies because the SDG motive has not been talked about before. I'm the first person that's ever talked about this musical motif. Now, but that's just the beginning of Bach here. Watch, watch what he does, okay? Look at, the, and this is really mind-blowing here. This, is, this really blew my mind when I discovered it. Okay, S is 19. Okay, if you count the alphabet, S is the 19th letter. If you count the alphabet, D is the fourth letter. And if you count to G, G is the seventh letter of the alphabet of both the, the English and the German alphabet. 19 plus 4 plus 7 equals 30. 30. I, I happen to believe that the inventions in symphonias and the Goldberg variations have something to do with this. I know I can't prove it, there's no way of proving that, but I have suspected for many years that, that there was a reason why Bach wrote 30 Goldberg variations and 30 inventions and symphonias, and that's because S, D, and G equal 30 when you add those letters up. Okay, now that's just the beginning. That's, I got sidetracked a little bit. Now we're going to add 14 to Bach. So S, D, and G add to 30. Bach, B-A-C-H, adds to 14, if we've, as we've discovered already. Now, 30 plus 14, S-D-G plus Bach, equals 44. S-D-G plus Bach equals 44. Measure 44. <laughs> this is just, this blew my mind when I, you know, I, I didn't discover this until later. I discovered all this like one year, I don't know, 1992, then a couple years later, I don't know, maybe a couple years later, I discovered, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, I started adding these together, and said, well, this is bar 44. BACH plus SDG equals 44, it's in bar 44, it's fulfilled in bar 44, of course, it's between 44 and 45, but 44 is, is the completion of it right here. SDG plus Bach equals 44. You put it in bar 44. It's the first time in the complete art of fugue that BACH and SDG appear non-transposed in the original pitches. Although this one is, is in retrograde. Bar 44. I mean, this is just mind-boggling. How did he do this? You know, I, I think he, Bach just probably loved it. He, he, he probably diddled around and figured out, uh, or maybe planned it. You know, he, I think he planned it this way. Perhaps he didn't and God planned it. I don't know. Whoever planned it, it worked out that way. That SDG plus Bach equals 44. This all happens in bar 44. I don't know what else to say. It's just amazing to me. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, and, and as I said, if I had, <laughs> I could have 10 of these whiteboards, I could fill them up with the SDG motif, 
Uh, years ago, I made a list like I did with the BACH motif, and I, I listed, I went through box complete works or something, and I, I don't know what, what possessed me to do that, but I spent uh, several years, actually, I think, going through box complete works, finding all the SDG motifs. And um, the, these are instances here that are uh, just, just a few, just a, just a small sample of the examples that I found that in which Bach used the SDG motif in works other than the art of fugue. Fascinating. Now, I'm sure many of you, if you play organ, if you're an organist, you're familiar with the so-called Saint Anne fugue. Well, it begins with, it doesn't begin with E flat DG, but in bar three, there's a clear E flat DG, and in the end, that th it comes back. It's all over the place, and it's literally all over that fugue. This is a fugue that concludes Klavier Übung three, the third part of the Klavier Übung, sometimes known as the German organ mass. And so he concludes, he concludes Klavier Übung three with a uh, Triple fugue. Actually, it's it's a fugue in three sections. Three sections, three flats, and a three pitch musical motif, S D G, Soli Deo Gloria, right there. Now, there's another uh, instance here, in in the prelude. Uh, the prelude. In the E flat major prelude of Book One of the Well Tempered Clavier, uh, there it's also in three sections, just like the Saint Anne fugue. It has three flats. It's in the key of E flat, and he uses this theme. This is the second theme that comes. This is in bar 19, and then in bars 25 and 26, he has another E flat. D and a G, S, D, G. So uh, this prelude is actually a double fugue. I believe it's a double fugue. It's a very long fugue. The prelude, the E flat major prelude, is actually one of the longest fugues in book one of the Well Tempered Clavier. So the prelude is actually a fugue. And he uses S, D, G. Now here's one that's fascinating. Um, in this prelude here, um, the A major prelude of Book One of the Well Tempered Clavier, um, the prelude consists of three themes or three subjects that are stacked up on each other uh, various ways. Sometimes we call that an obligato um, usage of the themes because they all appear together. And uh, the quarter note theme, the slow note theme, goes... Um, so you have an S, D, G there. Now, um, it's not a coincidence, because this... This theme here is almost identical to the one used in the Art of Fugue, that uses the the SDG motif. So you can tell that if you compare that quarter note theme and the A major prelude of Book One of the Well Tempered Clavier with the this theme that has the SDG in it of the well of the Art of Fugue, you'll find it's it's almost identical. And so you know that Bach was up to something. He knew what was going on. It's not a coincidence. But not only that, but this fugue of the A major prelude here. It's the fugue that has all these rests. It's that one. Well, you have an A, G sharp, C sharp. S, D, G. Right there. So he uses it in a theme, in one of the themes from the prelude. It's the first three notes in the fugue. S, D, G, separated by some rests. Now here's one that's fascinating. We've all heard this. We've all, we 
we've all heard that fugue, the most famous fugue of all. Well, these, let's just count those as pickups. We have the main motif in this subject. is the SDG motif in retrograde. What do you know? It's all over the place. Now, um, what's really fascinating is this. Take, take, um, and, and you know, this is all over the place. Uh, I just, if I had three more boards, I could fill them up with all the examples. These are not coincidences. This view here, fascinating. The B flat minor fugue from book one. This is the a very beautiful B flat minor fugue. Well, look, look at what Bach did. You know, he used this is this is a good example of where he really used his imagination. He didn't want to just drill in a permutation of the SDG motif like he did in other places, but he did this. He used a very sneakily, very... Okay, he goes down a fourth, down a perfect fourth, then he goes way up. He goes up an octave and one step. Okay, but if you transpose that, it goes up to G flat. But if you transpose, if you put that G flat down an octave here, you have, you have that. Retrograde. So the first three pitches of the B flat minor fugue is the SDG motif in retrograde, disguised by, by an octave displacement. He's putting the note up another octave to sort of disguise it. So there are many very innovative and, and uh, inventive ways that Bach used the SDG motif. And for that reason, I declare right now that the SDG motif in Bach's music was the, the most used motif in all of his music. You know, I was playing this for you the other day in a You know, the beautiful F sharp major fugue from book one. And I was, uh, <laughs> I was thinking, well, gosh, that's a, that da, 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 that comes right there. So it's a retrograde inversion of the SDG motif. You may think initially, oh, that's just a coincidence. You, you, you can do it with anything. No, you can't. <laughs> You can't do this with anything. Bach knew it. And he came to this world to declare the glory of God through his music. And for that reason, the SDG motif, I believe, is the most used musical motif. And he also used it with the BACH motif, which he didn't use as much, but he still used it. And as we found out here, Right in bar 44 of Contrapuntus 8, he combines them together. So, I hope that this will lead to some more research in this area. Of course, I have not exhausted all the research. I have just opened up the doors for box scholars today and future box scholars tomorrow and beyond to do a little research and look into box music and use this information as a springboard for uh, discovering the genius of Bach and what he did with his music and his use of cryptograms and number symbolism. So this is the end of part two. I hope you enjoyed this presentation of the two parts or the two halves of the BACH motive and the SDG motif and um, I wish you God's blessings and, and that uh, you have a nice year in 2018. And until we meet again, thanks. Bye.